Good morning, Richard. Good morning, James. Thank you very much for doing this. No uh, problem at all. We're going to talk about Rockwood Strategic, which has had an eventful year or so, but um, actually had, was one of the best performing funds last year uh, of all types, not, not just UK small cap. Um, so um, I think, as usual, I'm going to ask you the, the question. So just tell us a bit about the funds, what, what it's trying to do, please. Sure, sure. No problem at all. Um, um, I think the, the most important thing is we're trying to target uh, UK small cap, actually at the bottom end of the small cap market. Uh, and through doing that, we're looking to compound wealth long term for, for our shareholders. Um, the micro cap market is very, very inefficient uh, because basically no one covers it anymore or doesn't cover it very particularly well or with much um, uh, interest. And uh, but we're putting to bear a lot of uh, specialist exp expertise in this part of the market. I've I'm a qualified chartered accountant and I also did my chartered financial analyst uh, exams and, and I've managed small cap money for over 20 years. And Harbour Capital, um, which was formed by Christopher Mills, has also has a significant amount of UK small cap um, uh, experience. What, what we're our mindset is very much absolute. So we're looking to deliver 15% IRR investments uh, over the long term. Uh, what that means uh, in reality is we're seeking every stock we buy, we we're looking for ones that could double over three to five years. And 15% is the the outcome of a stock doubling over over five years. So a decent three to five year view. Um and we benefit from the Harwood network, which is a bit different from um, other fund management groups in the Harwood uh, has a private equity uh, team with it's on its seventh fund, all of which have been uh, very successful to date and a private debt fund. And we also run a couple of other investment trusts in the sector. You'll be probably well aware, James, being uh, North Atlantic Small Companies and uh, Oryx International Growth. Uh, and finally, we are 100% um, focused on this. This is all I do. And we're very aligned. Uh, Christopher Mills and myself have bought 29.9% of the trust. Uh, so we have genuine uh, skin in the game. I was listening to the uh, what you were just saying about Scottish Mortgage Trust. And it just made me just think, I mean, you couldn't really get a bigger contrast with going from what's going on with Scottish Mortgage and then straight into to little old Rockwood. I mean, I think they're nine and a half billion market cap. We're, we're 50 million. They're, they're, they have a massive firm with uh, masses of people and I suspect masses of internal meetings, whereas we are quite a small firm. We've got about a billion in equities, two billion assets under, under management over, overall um, and, and a small and nimble team. I think every one of our stocks is under $300 million. I think your slide showed that they have a seven under under 300 million dollars and why that's important is you kindly put up that that that, that chart but this is the uh, numis uh, data which tracks various size bands through history back to 1955 and you can see in the top right hand corner of that that since 1955 uh through to 21 the the return was um 21,168 for your average pound invested in the bottom 1,000 companies in the market. And that's what's key here is, is that the Numis Small Cap Index, which is the bottom 10% of the market, was up 8,000%, which is also a fantastic small cap effect, miles more than the larger cap indices. But the very smallest companies do even better, much, much better. But because of how the, the industries moved, you know, I would dare I say it, companies like Bailey Gifford and, and other larger firms, they can't really practically for their clients or even maybe even commercially make, make sense for them to run money that focuses on the very bottom of, of the market. So whilst this effect is, is you know, is no, no one would dispute and is absolutely amazing, there's very few people that actually uh, spend all day long trying to um, access it. And that's what Rockwood uh, strate Strategic does. Um, I also noted they they on your thing they they uh, they are obviously geared. We have no gearing whatsoever, and they have ninety nine stocks. We only have nineteen. We're very concentrated. We focus just on the very best ideas. Um, so the so your in terms of the invest 
investment opportunity here we um we are um it's it's very inefficient as i've mentioned it's also a significant universe there's many hundreds of stocks here and then often they're what i call hidden gems so just things that just really good niche british companies that are listed that just not enough people know, know about and as a result are, mi are mispriced and have quite exciting futures fallen angels there's a lot that sort of end up in small cat having been um um had better times that the market's given up and got emotional about and sort of throwing the baby out with the bath water. Um, and then there's a number of other types of businesses, I call sort of lost corporates that sort of had a had a bit of momentum to their business model, but have sort of got a bit stayed, bit of, you know, lost their dynamism and need need um a bit of an injection of um either new management or not. Or and also some sort of family businesses that may be listed to get a partial exit, but where there's generational change. And again, they're sort of at an interesting point in their in their juncture. What's critical about Rockwood and one of the key reasons why we've been performing so well, I believe, is, is that we have a very clear value and recovery mindset. And that is def definitely very differentiated than um, almost all the other uh, um, wider small cap and micro cap uh, sector who on the whole either have a kind of balanced approach or um, are much more focused on finding growth stocks in the in, in this small cap world. We think there's serious opportunities in the turnarounds and having a value discipline. And we think there's less competition for those kind of uh, um, those kind of investments. Uh, I mentioned we only have 19 stocks at the moment, although the majority of the portfolio is actually in the top 10. And um, we de-risk that level of concentration by uh, material due diligence. Actually, having less stocks allows us to do a lot more work than if you have um, uh, you know, a much more diversified portfolio. And that not only gives us an information advantage because we can spend more time speaking to customers and suppliers and competitors and all the board members and all the rest of it. Um, but it also, uh, and, and that gives information, but it, it equally allows us to de-risk um, the having a more concentrated and the, the, the having enough information to make sure we're comfortable taking a really uh, decent sized position in the company. We are also engaged. We're not uh, out and out uh, activist. Um, um uh in a kind of sort of how the press would describe it but we do very much engage with our um companies um it was announced actually uh earlier this week that um I, i'm going on the board of uh, another one of our companies called pressure tech technologies and um you know that level of uh, insight and understanding that we will have with me being on the board is 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 very very um you know, significant and beneficial for us being able to drive that business uh, forward and maximize shareholder value. I think finally, we it, it, obviously it's an investment trust, um, but I think small cap that uh, having done it many, many years, I, I do actually think small cap is more attuned to being in a closed end vehicle than an open ended vehicle. My my uh, friends and colleagues in the small cap world, most of them uh, are very much totally focused on open ended funds. And that daily liquidity, the ability of the fund, the money to be uh, whipped away if uh, clients decide they want to um, set against the underlying liquidity of small caps isn't, you know, I think, very well, very well matched, and and as a result, I think, I think I, you know, this really is the right kind of structure to be investing in small cap. I know some of the other actual small cap investment trusts they also run open ended funds with pretty much a similar holdings, so they're not even really utilising that 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 benefits to its full of full advantage, which we are at at, at Rockwood. In terms of how we go about doing things, which is the next slide, we're looking for proven businesses, um, identifiable assets, I would say probably much more mature than, than sort of stages that um, Scottish Mortgage would get involved with business, businesses. 
And as I mentioned, the value investor mindset. So we're very much focused on uh, companies that are generating free cash flow and can generate significant free cash flow to investors. We try and find what the catalysts are going to be for change to the circumstances, either, either which would create either a re-rating or an improvement in a shareholder value realization. And once we sort of worked out what what the catalysts might be, we 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 engage with the various stakeholders to uh, de-risk and understand what what's going to how how we'd achieve those those catalysts that that is typically the board management um we will reach out to other shareholders and explain what we think needs to happen sometimes they come to us and say can you can you help us with this 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 company um and then we work out a thesis for what the potential recovery and profitability will will uh, recovered profitability would be what the balance sheet position would be once it's sort of repaired or mended if that's what's required um and also what sort of valuation rating the business might be placed upon what once um everything's going really really you know swimming swimmingly um and at the same time as doing that we then develop an exit thesis and we do this up front uh before we buy as to how we may exit that that stock over that three to five year uh, investment to horizon which involves sort of understanding what private equity players are playing in the particular niche industry or space which trade buyers may want to buy the business um so that we are not uh wholly dependent on the secondary market i.e the stock market uh in terms of other buyers to buy our stock after us after it's after it's um doubled doubled the next slide actually shows uh, this in just a little bit more more detail, um, but it, it's more about the life cycle of of companies that we 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 target. Often the business has done some sort of strategic error in some attempt to get bigger. They have done bad M and A. The management often some kind of complacent, tired, or just aren't very good. Um, and often there might have been some sort of poor operational execution that typically puts the shares into a, a funk, gets them uh, sold off, derated, and depresses profit, uh, profit, profits. Um, that often leads to financial stress in the business and a lack of investors wanting to sort of finance, finance it. And often quite a high emotional backdrop for the stakeholders. The management are upset with themselves, possibly. Uh, shareholders are annoyed. The shares have been going down. Uh, want it, uh, you know, you've got loss aversion, don't really want to have it. They don't want to have to talk to investors about it. I want to get on to talk about the things that have been doing well. And um, the dominant narrative around the company is just typically negative. It's sort of, oh, why would you look at that? Don't don't pay any attention to them. MC Saatchi is a very good example of this. Uh, that's still in the portfolio where they had, the, the founders have got pretty staid who'd set up MC Saatchi a number of years ago. And uh, they, they, they'd allowed uh, poor financial controls to develop in the business, a loss of control and uh, accounting errors. And there was huge board uh, resignations and the business got itself into quite a uh, a situation with the way it's structured its, its m and uh, and that opened up an opportunity for us to invest in an absolutely brilliant um, globally recognised brand uh, at a very, very uh, cheap valuation. Um, what then happens, though, is, is that the once we've sort of got uh, the business on, on the turn it, through an involvement of enhancing management board, uh, or it may indeed include replacing certain people, um, a kind of value creation or realization strategies developed that we'll communicate with, discuss with the with with the management and uh, and push push for uh, leads to an operational plan and the kind of target returns that we see the business make making typically does involve some form of balance sheet stabilization. Uh, to get that debt down, either through disposals or we would that use that that opportunity to um, invest material new capital in the business to 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 get it on the straight straight and narrow. 
and our crest checks got a big arrow underneath it we'll talk about that in a moment but it's a recent example but at the end of this process what happens is the returns if everything's gone according to correct have got back to to where they should be it, margins have recovered profitabilities have has gone up uh, back to where it was maybe before or near where it was before that typically um uh, involves a, a re-rating of spot multiples by the stock market at the same time so you get a sort of double whammy of improving profitability and improving multiples on that on that improving profitability by now the narrative has been refreshed we often engage on ir and how to get that narrative right but people are starting to say this is um you know okay now not not on the naughty step and and then we we seek to 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 exit uh with our uh, we, you know with our target target returns a, a good case study for this little back a little bit backward looking which um i apologize for but i do think it's worth worth talking about because it's the most recent uh outcome we've had and has been a key driver of the portfolio in recent uh uh months is crest chick uh which was a big manufacturer renter of load banks outside uh of america very cash generative and asset rich uh business load banks sort of test power reliability so they're you know everything from a hospital that wants its backup power to work if the mains goes down um for obvious reasons through to data centers that need to have very uh clear um and stable power uh, power and backup power um uh, facilities uh we initially got involved in a refinancing it um through both an equity position and a convertible position and um we uh, from about uh early 2020 we got heavily engaged with uh driving um shareholder value at the, the business we introduced one ned a, a gentleman called stephen yap um, who was appointed to the board in 2020, 2020. Um, uh, relatively shortly afterwards, we, the, the, the CEO re was retired and the executive chairman, a guy called Peter Harris, uh, took, uh, well, he was, he was non-executive chairman, sorry, I apologise, uh, became uh, executive chairman and with a focus on uh, delivering for, uh, for shareholders from there. We also got a COO appointed to support that 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 uh that role and the fact that the ceo was was leaving um by by uh early 2022 we actually um requested and had uh nick mills from harwood uh, also went on to the the board now we engaged with this business on um it had lost its uh, focus on return on capital which is absolutely critical for uh, an asset rich manufacturing business a uh, higher business so uh um careful watchers will know uh, that following this th they did adopt that both in in their reporting which they hadn't been doing prior to that uh we obviously were involved in the board evolution that i that i explained we also got involved in making sure that the the team had an appropriate long-term incentive package so that they were aligned with us to deliver shareholder value which we did in 2021 absolutely critical to it was that the previous ceo was um very very reluctant to selling a business he had bought called tasman which was the second division which in our view was destroying shareholder value and um it was an oil and gas um um exposed business that hired drilling equipment um around around the world primarily in australasia and the middle uh, and the middle east and had been loss making for some time and he'd bought it near the near the peak in the prior cycle and was sort of licking his wounds a bit and just not prepared to move on but we managed to convince with the uh, alongside the changes that the right thing to do is to sell that business which which they did um that allows some investment back into the core crest business we actually changed the name of the company it was called Northbridge industrial services in the stock market prior to this got its change name to the core business crest check um the expansion of that facility allowed them to bring forward some of their uh bulging order book in the in the load bank business and um hey presto um EBITDA started to recover like our normal life cycle um pretty aggressively um and they were able to start articulating uh their involvement with um the whole narrative of energy transition which load banks and the use of uh, temporary and uh backup in power um is linked to uh which they which they adopt as well so it's, it was starting to re-rate 
and eventually we got the business uh, sold at the back end of last year to Agreco. So finally, um, three things on this. So um, Harwood, uh, Rockwood had a big stake. We we bought about fourteen uh, percent of the company, but other Harwood funds actually bought more as well. So we ended up only 25% of the company. So in a really strong, influential position on how to drive shareholder value at this company. Um, the Rockwood portfolio weighting got up to 31%, um, which just which you won't see in many other uh, funds. But um, we, you know, we're entirely comfortable with, with the direction of travel for both the business and, and, what, and our exit thesis and we allowed that position to run run strong um so we benefited from that concentration now that money now has gone into cash we started reinvesting some of that but cash in rockwood is now 25 percent uh position which has been um we've been uh, not uh we've been very judiciously <laughs> investing through the last few weeks um i.e i no rush um so that's yeah so that's crest check um and I, I the next slide a slightly sort of change slight pivot because I just wanted I think it's relevant for your your listeners it's just a, it's really important for Rockwood but it's also something that uh maybe Scottish mortgage are thinking about quite carefully there has been massive massive regime change in markets in in our view uh, in the last 18 months and some people are still not really fully recognizing what that really means um i think 18 trillion worth of negative yielding bonds down to none would show you quite a big uh, regime change bearing in mind that prior to mid 2013 there never been really any negative yielding bonds ever as far as i understand so we we've had any investment strategy been running for the previous 10 years with a certain type of approach or style has been running in a very different regime to what we are in now will remain in for quite some time i would i would argue i think the right hand slide i i also just think is amazing in that you know it's showing you that nearly 50 percent of nasdaq companies are are um you know got negative forward earnings at the year end of 2022 that's pretty impressive if you look in the, at the chart and go back to what the percentage of uh, loss making business in the year 2000, 2001 were the so called TMT bubble. I remember I was in, uh, investing at that that point, and I, you know there was you know it felt like you know every every second company was one that had you know didn't really know how it's going to generate any money or or whatever. But we've we've gone to some new level in the last few few years uh, of what the stock market and investors will be prepared to to uh, invest in. Um, and that's just basically not what Rockwood's interested in. So we are focused in all the other stocks uh, that uh, make money. And we think that a lot of investors are going to have to start uh, reappraising um, those sorts of businesses uh, now. Um, and one of those is Flotec Fluid Power, which is a live example. So this is still in the portfolio. Um, it's a uh, about 74 million market cap. They uh, distribute uh, fluid power components, and uh, they also have a service, and they also deliver services into the fluid power industry alongside that sort of uh, alongside that uh, that distribution capability. A number of locations around the UK, a couple in the in the Netherlands, 600 employees. You can see lots of sales relative to its uh, market cap. So not a multiples of sales type stock, which everyone's got far too used to in recent in recent years. And they'd make a decent profit, making about um, 11 million of, uh, of EBITDA. But they do have considerable scope for improving their profitability. The EBIT margins around about seven and a half percent. They really should be making EBIT margins, we think, of at least 11 percent. And there are lots of distribution businesses which make uh, higher, th higher than that. So that's that would be quite a big material improvement to profitability if they were delivering the right level of, uh, of EBIT margins. And the stock turn, which I in that second 
um, bullet of 2.4, that's actually pretty low for a dis distributor. It means they're not turning the capital that they have, the stock that they have quick as quickly as they should be. And that, that influences the returns back to us as shareholders. You want a distributor really turning its, turning its stock like a kind of rabid washing machine so that you just you know generate loads and loads of margin multiple times during during the during each reporting period they they've been it, it, it distribution in this space you know it's historically been kind of a big large sort of slightly greasy i suspect uh catalog that sits on the desk in the back in, in someone's manufa in manufacturing facility and and then when something breaks or they need something new or whatever they they grab the flowtech catalog and find page 24 and then order the parts uh, via the via the phone and and Kel surprise that that all needs to move online and they've been pretty slow um we think not particularly effective actually uh going through that process uh at, at pace uh, but they are doing they have got their first iteration of this now up and running and we we think there's quite a lot of upside from doing that better going forward they were also pursuing a roll-up strategy that that uh, of buying other smaller fluid power businesses which they had they sort of paused uh they weren't very particularly well integrated and um that has the opportunity um to be restarted in the future once the the, the business is performing better the chairman is a chap called roger mcdowell who's one of uh, britain's great uh we think uh um uh, well, he's a mix of things, really, industrialist, board member, uh, investor, and he really understands shareholder value. He, he was on the board of a company that was in our portfolio before called Orgean, which we made multiples of our money, much more than doubling our money in. Um, and one of the non-executive directors uh, that was appointed last year uh, was uh, Jamie Brooke. Now, now on, on Rockwood's um, trust, we, we may not be Bailey Gifford with an investment team of thousands, um, uh, but we do have an investment advisory group, which we formed, has six people on it, all of which are very um, experienced investors. I'm just thinking you commenting about the investment experience that was uh, on the board of, of, of um, SMT, but on the Rockwood Investment Advisory Group, we have uh, obviously Christopher Mills, uh, but Jamie Brooke, who's spent 30 years working for everyone from Hanover to Lombard ODA to Gartmoor, Janus Henderson, a uh, very experienced small cap investor. We also have Rupert Dyson, who's been uh, what used to be one of the partners of Sloan Robinson and has his own firm, Edel Capital, which is a hedge fund who follows small cap very closely. There is um, um, uh, there is Yuri uh, Kajmirian from uh, Majet from Majedi, who's a very experienced um, analyst and, and fund manager, and also Adam Parker, who is one of the founders of Majedi Asset Management. Uh, again, a, a very experienced investor. But those two that are there are, are on the board of Flowtech, and um, I, I mentioned this because you'll see one of the lurb, you can see in one of the lurb. Uh, uh, bullets. Uh, although Harwood's stake is, I think, uh, six or seven, six or seven percent. The overall um, stake within um, within the Harwood group of funds is twenty seven and a half percent. Again, as as with um, Christian, meaning that we have significant influence uh, um, and can really make our views listened to about how we want to maximise shareholder value. You can see. Uh, they're a very cheap spot valuation. However, you know, as I've put, we think the recovery bit dar it could be as high as eighteen million pounds, uh, and uh, thus meaning, you know, one that we expect has the potential to at least uh, double double from here. I'm sort of uh, nearly finished now for those who want to ask the questions, but this would be uh, the what I call the core holdings. Uh, it's about 44% uh, percent of the NAV currently. These are what core means is that we've taken uh, a at least 5% stake and we have a fully worked thesis um, through to exit thesis that we're 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 working we're working on. Um float, you can see flow tape, flow power there. And I got it slightly, it was slightly less than what I thought we had in 5.8% in flow tape flow power, but as I said, the Harvard um 
just over 25%. Interestingly, above that, Centaur Media, uh, again, a 9% portfolio weighting. When these things work, like uh, as it did with Crestcheck, they really impact the NAV of our portfolios. Um, Centaur, we have 6% of the company in Rockwood, but Harwood Funds take us up to 29.9% of the company. And I am actually a non-executive director of uh, personally of Centaur Media as well. So again, influence, interest, significant stake. And you can see on there on the right, uh, a ludicrously low 6.7 EV EBITDA spot multiple. I mean, really, really quite low. This business is just reported um, that it would be doing, uh, you know, profitability is doing profitability of 20% EBITDA margins. Um, really, really profitable business. And as you can see, is has has net cash. Um, RM, the largest holding is a educational supplies and um, services business um, with a decent um, exposure to technology within its mix of um, services that it does. It's been around for over 20 years. I've followed it for many years. We've built a 10% stake in that business. It's hugely undervalued at 54 million. They've got um, results coming up in the next week or so, which we um, you know, are going to have to explain what's been a very, very difficult year um, for, for the business but where change is massively underway. The catalysts are all happening as we speak or have been happening as well. In as much as there is a new CEO starting, uh, there's an interim finance director, we expect a CFO appointment um, imminently. Um, there, the company has been making some disposals and we think the business has considerable upside, uh, at least 100%. We suspect quite a lot more, more than that. Um, Pressure Technologies um, is a business which um, makes is the market leader in uh, making specialist cylinders, pressurized cylinders, which um, hold everything from hydrogen in the emerging hydrogen eco economy through to other gases. They have a significant exposure to the defense industry. They recently announced a massive contract that um, um, their cylind uh, cylinders are going into the next two. Uh, I don't think they've actually announced exactly who the client is, but they ex hugely exposed the uh, market commentary is uh, highlighted that it's the um, um, the submarine pro the UK submarine programs. You can see we have a twenty percent stake. I mentioned earlier I've just gone onto the board of Pressure Technologies. I actually spent uh, most of yesterday with them in Sheffield and the evening and afternoon before beforehand. Again, the sort of access that. Um, other fund managers just just won't 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 have. We think that business has significant recovery uh, potential over the next two to three years. Um, I think uh, I'm not. I think I'm going to pause there um, because we'll just see what people want me to talk about. There's one uh, one more slide, a couple more slides. One on uh, one on just on performance, which you kindly mentioned earlier. That has been um, going pretty well for us over decent sustained period. I started working on the um was appointed to the strategy in 2019 and you can see on the far right of the page some of the mul money multiples that we get for our for our holdings i wish they were all like Orgean, but again we are we're targeting uh, doubling up doubling our money and just to finish off james the final page just a bit of fun information so we're we're main listed we used to be on aim but last year we we moved uh, um, we moved the the, the vehicle onto um onto the main market we've got three board members noel lamb who used to be the cio of russell investments and formerly at lazards ken lever who is a very experienced um corporate small cap board and exec uh, board member and executive uh, and Paul Dudley, who's a corporate finance uh, specialist. Um, and um, the fees we are doing, it's bargain, it's bargain basement, James. It's um, we're, we're currently charging a flat fee of £120,000 a year uh, until we get the fund up to £60 million. You can see we're currently £49 million. Um, so we're, we're heavily incentivized to do that because um at at 60 million we'll charge along the same lines as what the other specialist funds that have this highly engaged type approach uh do some some 
PE funds or some of the other more specialist funds are doing. And we also have a 10% performance fee, absolute high watermark uh, over a hurdle uh, with no, no catch up uh, at all. Our brokers are singers. And if they, if you don't get, if people don't get what they, they want from today's chat, then um, uh, do, do go to our, our website, which has fact sheets, presentations, and a, and a, and a lots of explanation about what, what, what I've just discussed. Great. Thank you. It's quite comprehensive, as you said. Um, let's talk about size as an issue first. Uh, there's a question that popped up about the size of the fund, 49 million. It, it, presumably, you'd like that to be a lot bigger. How, how big could it be before um, the size becomes a problem? Um, 250 million is the answer to that. Um, so we've got considerable scope, scopes of four four to five X the, the size of the fund before it was a serious problem. Now, capacity is something that you will see yet again and again and again in fund managers, that they're not very good at either keeping to their promises or allowing their strategies to uh, remain of the right size to, to do that. But we absolutely are committed to making sure we don't get too big. Uh, and one of the main reasons is that we've invested our own money in it and um, we, we, it, we're far more focused on... Um, for it's Christopher Mills, a significant investment about generating returns from that than generating returns from the fees of the fund just because it's it's big. Why two? Why two fifty? It's quite simple because we're a, a concentrated approach and we want to take um, stakes in, in in businesses. We think the real blind spot for normal small cap funds these days. Is below 250 million. So if you take a kind of say a 150 million pound fund, uh, if we get to 150 million pound fund, if we want to have a 10% position like with RM, if we want to have 10% of the company, we've got to have a 15 million pound position. If you see what I mean. So, so the the key is we can't we we the the, the mark the market caps that we're focused on sort of implies the right level size of the fund given the size of stakes and the concentration that we want to have um is there a sort of minimum market cap where things just shouldn't be listed at all yeah yes absolutely absolutely um if you can't make it work um if you haven't got a plan to rapidly get out of below 20 million market cap um well i think market cap's the wrong word because the market cap might ref reflect a massive undervaluation of a much bigger business it's really does the business itself generate sufficient levels of profitability that the costs of being a PLC are more than covered by that profitability. And uh, the way to think about the way I think about it, James, is like, say you've got a 20 million market cap that's maybe sort of fairly valued, but only but can't make more than one million pounds a year in profit at 20 million, it hasn't really got a growth strategy or anything it can do on the MA front. Then if it only makes a million pounds a year, it might have half a million or 400 grand's worth of um, kind of PLC listing costs. And then it might have a bit more just because it wants to get bigger, but it can't get bigger. And all of a sudden, you essentially, you never make any, you basically just don't make any money. So so what's the opportunity for Rockwood here is that we are trying to seek out businesses that can either break out, but if they don't, either trade their better homes would be a trade buyer or a private equity firm that wouldn't need all the costs of being listed or would be able to have less central overhead thus meaning they could generate a reasonable return on their on their investment what's the kind of time frame for deploying this cash you've got from crash Sheik? um i've it's i'm in no major rush because i think markets are going to remain you know uh, I, i'm pretty cautious on markets it will be quite opportunity driven and we can go up to in one investment we could go seven eight percent off straight off so waiting rm for instance was zero in the portfolio last august and it's now 10 percent of the portfolio um that said we we were we cashed to get up to 33 percent because i had a bit of cash and we're down to 25 already um i would imagine that uh, at least five to ten percent of it 
will have been invested by the time you get to Q4. Um, and then it literally will be opportunity opportunity driven. Um, so it could quite easily be us down to a sort of a kind of core cash position of say five to seven percent, which allows us to do follow on investments that we've got planned in the in the in, with our existing investments in the pipeline as and when they come in without having to sort of sell anything to fund to fund those or be available for um, unique situations that comes up. So. I, I would I would be highly surprised if um, we hadn't invested almost all of it by Christmas. Okay, fair enough. It might um, be it might take slightly, but what I James, what's really important is, and I've seen this with other another strategy. It's unfair to Nate to call them out on it, but in this type of investing, we are so because we're focused on absolute returns and not losing money kind of what the market is doing and kind of not being fully invested, which your typical small cap fund is right, really worried about because if the market goes up, they, they, they let, they'll they lag for a bit. And, you know, it's just not our mindset. So if the opportunities aren't there, we, we won't feel any pressure to invest the money. Fair enough. Well, I mean, that, that, that sort of alludes to another question we've got here, which is um, how do you go about buying sort of 5 10% stakes in things that are by the sort of nature quite illiquid? Yeah. So, and, and then, yeah. contrast to that, if if you had something that didn't work, how would you get out of it? Yeah. Okay. So, for, first question: the two main the two main routes that we take the stakes are either via blocks, other blocks from other fund managers, um, or an actual some form of fi fi financing point. Um, RM, uh, if I just run through, because I think it's probably worthwhile. Well, if we did flip back to that previous slide, if you go, if you go, like RM was bought because a large fund manager panicked when they profit warned in the summer and dumped their whole twelve percent stake into market makers, and we bought our st our stake off the market makers uh, at that point. Um, Central Media was was again bought from other fund managers and in the market, um, primarily because it was um, becoming smaller and smaller because they were disposing of divisions, and fund managers were just we, we we quite like it, but it's just becoming too small. We're just selling our our blocks. We don't want to be invested any anymore. Pressure Technologies was through a financing. Um, Bond Hill was through a financing. Smooth was in the open market, as was Vanel. So it's typically through blocks or whatever. And, you know, because of our contacts, we will, you know, a lot of small cap fund managers will be looking for liquidity and things. So they will, they'll they'll let it be known, you know, we think, we're, you know, we're not going to try and start trying to sell this in the market because it'd be suicidal. But we, we let a few uh, houses know that, if we were bid for a block, we're, we're, we're happy to move on with our lives. And that's how we, I mean, that's how we would get a block. Or we just identify something that will need a, um, a financing as well. The second question was what happens when things go wrong? Uh, very good, very good question because not, not all, all they do. Um, in the last year, one thing, one thing, and I'll just use a case study because that's probably best. In the last year, one thing um, Divinity didn't, didn't work out as we hoped. We, got involved in a company called Seraphine, which makes maternity wear, kind of mid to mid mid to high end maternity wear. Uh, Princess Kate was a, uh, a, a user internationally. So they had sales in America, Europe, uh, Asia and the and the UK. And it had been floated during the last um, cycle, near the top of the last cycle for 150 million uh, uh, sterling. And it collapsed, uh, unsurprisingly. And um, we started building a position. And we bought a few percent of the company. We hadn't got to five yet. It wasn't a core position. We were just building, getting to know it. And um, we and we started buying it when it was about twenty, uh, about twenty million market cap, and um, uh, maybe nineteen, maybe nineteen million market cap. So um, nothing much changed, but it'd be massively deep. D-rated. De um, what, um, trans what transpired that we 
uh, had underestimated, as had the company, is that they were caught along alongside a lot of the other online retailers with regards to um, the kind of changing customer acquisition costs online that had come through from companies like Facebook and, and Google, uh, which meant that in order to sort of the money you would spend marketing digitally that Seraphine was spending, they had been spending about 12 to 13 pounds per customer um, a, a customer basket would have been about over 70 pounds and they're often the customers would have more will come back more than once uh, in fact they always used to come back more, more than once the average would um so it was a, a well worth uh, investment if you're 13 pounds but by within a few months of us buying the shares the 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 market had materially changed this has affected other online retailers like asos and people like that too but it, it had gone up to 20 Five twenty-six pounds, and that was really compromising the um, the profitability of the company. So the shares fell even uh, further from our from our point of eighteen million, uh, eighteen ninety million uh, down further. And the long and short of it, but we 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 um, it's that's actually just it has been bid for, um, and um, it's been taken out um, at roughly the price that we we paid for it. And in that instance, we didn't need to um, push for that as an outcome for a, um, so that we could get our money back. Uh, but we had analyzed the situation well because a 45% shareholder was a private equity house. And we thought that the, uh, if the, if the, the market was giving up on the stock um, and it, um, if the market continued to uh, give up on the stock then 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 the private equity firm would probably do do something about that so we kind of we kind of thought that was our backstop so we've, we we got out we got out got out through there in, in to add one further point so more often in things that don't work out we see it we basically roll up our sleeves materially get involved and work through to work through the business to a to a logical um uh you know exit or outcome it just takes longer basically to yeah, yeah. You it take, it's a really yeah you're totally right james james you're totally right and it sounds like some people are, we, we've got fun it, it, to be <laughs> totally transparent it's often how I, I would used to run my funds maybe 10 years you know things start going wrong and you basically just you know get out as quickly as possible move on and try and you know re, move, move whatever capital you've got left into the next thing and that's how companies fund managers with hundreds of holding or lots of holdings basically approach it most of the time um this approach because we're concentrated we have got the time to roll up our sleeves work out what the problems are and drive through we do and the, the key reason why it's worth doing is we almost always have got our kind of because we've got this value bias so even though it's a digital business like a seraphine because we knew we were buying it really what was genuine we were buying it at kind of half sales um we knew that in the end, we would end up be able to make money if we got all the right um, components right in the business. So oh, thank you. I mean, we, we covered an awful lot of ground there. I mean, there's, there's loads more we could have done, but um, I think we have run out of time. So, but thank you very much for your time today, Richard. That's really helpful. Well, thanks very much, and James. We'll, you know, we'll get you back on again another time and um, see how things have, have gone. But uh, no, I'd love to. I'd love to. I just, as I said, yeah, I think the. The key thing for me is, you know, we're not your normal small cap fund, but this strategy is working. We think there's nothing special about how it's been working. We'll be able to just continue to do it. And and hope and we are in, you know, our plans are to try and we're discounts really tightened in. Uh, we're hoping to just get to nav and do a little bit of tap issuance. So uh, it's just trying to try and grow it a bit. So that that's the strategy from here. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we will be back next week talking to the manager of Gore Street Energy Storage. Um, so I think we've got to wrap it up there. It's now three minutes past 12. But um, thank you for your time today and I'll see you next week. Goodbye.